Welcome to this fireside chat, everybody. Um, and I'm really excited because this is the, the chat that I've been looking forward to having over the last couple of days. And we're here today to talk about the long-term effects that this global trauma is having on our mental health. And I'm with the right person today to discuss this as Steve Carr is one of the most prevalent advocates for mental health in the UK. And before I introduce Steve, what I'd love to say is, if you've got any questions as we're going along, please do write in the chat box and they'll get fed through and we can keep this as interactive as possible. So that's enough of that, this side. I would love to say hello. Hello, Steve. Steve, how are you doing? That's a really good question. That's a really, really, really good question. And, you know, I'm going to be totally honest. Um, I'm adjusting. I'm adjusting right now. How easy is it that when we get asked that question of how are you, that we just say fine? Um, you raised a really good point. We're going through this global traumatic crisis and sadly it's all too easy to just say fine so you know what I'm going to be honest with you and I'm going to say I'm adjusting. That's really interesting and I absolutely agree with you Steve there's two you know it's everyone does it you know we're in the supermarkets we're walking down the streets and and, and people just say well your friends and your family how are you and it's just a it's, it's a gut reaction I'm fine. Um, and it's when we start sort of opening up and, and talking from our hearts that that's when the great things can happen. Steve, can you tell the audience a little bit about your story and your journey and what makes you um, so passionate about helping people in this space in, in mental health issues? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, well, my journey began uh, quite a few years ago. In fact, um, from childhood, I experienced a traumatic upbringing. And um, I lived on a council estate and uh, come into uh, as a family of five. Uh, my father was out to work and uh, my mother was a stay-at-home housewife. And she would look after us three children. And she was doing the best that she could with what she had, but it was still fairly traumatic. So by the age of 14, um, I had turned to drink and drugs to self-medicate and try and escape from the home life that I was experiencing. So I found people like me um, that were troubled and were, had a troubled uh, troubled life. So I was masking what was going on at home and self-medicating. By the age of 15, um, my brother was tragically killed in a car crash with uh, a group of children, the young being seven and the eldest being 18, which was his partner. And um, it was that day, Friday, the 13th of September, which was his partner's birthday, um, that he was tragically killed. And this was over 30 years ago now. Little did I know at the time of how much of an impact that would have on my life and my family's life, and in fact, the entire community. We didn't really know at the time that it was such a traumatic event that would have many repercussions because we didn't know how to deal with it at the time. So we contained it within the family and there was no help available that we could feel that we could go to. So there was no such thing as mental health first aiders. There was no EAP and certainly my family felt uneasy about going to help just in fear of you know the, the, the things that we hear of being locked up or you know that looked upon as if we were weak and you know I think that's a really important important point that we need to raise especially today um, it being International Men's Day because from that point onwards what we all did was we kind of like squashed all those feelings down and we didn't really talk about it and it wasn't until almost 25 years later that that traumatic experience had such an impact on my life that all of that trauma that wasn't dealt with came out in one fierce blow. And how did it manifest itself? You say it came out in one fierce blow. What, what happened? Well, going back to 2015, I was working as a fairly successful business development manager for um, a well-known cigarette manufacturer. And one day I was just at work and um, I received some bad news in work, tried to talk it through with my manager. Um, 
things just escalated into the point where I couldn't deal with what he was telling me. And I had a nervous breakdown whilst in work. I literally just sat down and cried. Um, so that is what was the beginning of my mental health breakdown. So it was in the middle of work. It was a working day. It was a Friday afternoon and it really had that impact. But what I didn't realize is where it all came from, where it all stemmed from. I just thought it was that event that caused it. And you didn't trace it back in any way to what had happened to your brother and what your family had gone through years before. No, at the time, I didn't even think it was from that event. I just thought, well, maybe it's because I wasn't coping. Maybe it was just because at that particular point that it just felt that it was too much. Um, but now, now knowing what I know now, um, I know it came from childhood trauma. Um, you know, and that's really important to recognize that what we're going through now, and as you say, we're going through a global traumatic crisis. And that for everyone, we may not recognize because we've never been through this experience before. So taking it back to the story for a moment, I've never experienced trauma before in my life and trauma affects people in many different ways. We might get through this fairly unscathed and many people may actually come through this being more triggered um, uh, and suffering with things like post-traumatic stress disorder. Like I say, it can affect people in lots of different ways. And we may not know the true outcome or the impact of this for many years to come. So when we go back to the story, I didn't know and I wasn't aware that it was trauma. There was underlying trauma within my life until that one thing that that day triggered me. And it triggered me to the extent where everything else had come, literally come up to the boil. So if we think about that now, we're thinking about the people that could have lost their jobs, th thinking about people that have lost loved ones. There's going to be bereavement. There's going to be people that have lost family and loved ones and jobs. And, and our focus right now is just trying to stay well. So let's go back to the story for, for a second here. Unbeknown to me, there was lots of trauma going on. And not having addressed that trauma led to the breakdown. That very same month, I was told uh, that I was struggling with stress. So I had a month out of work. I had a month out of work to try and figure out what was going on, speak to my GP and ask them um, if, if, if there was any help or support available. I didn't go into the details of that I was still taking drugs. I didn't go into the detail of what happened with my brother or, or the family life. When you were, sorry, Steve, just to interrupt you there. When you say you were still taking drugs, were these um, uh, recreational drugs or antidepressants? They, they, they described you antidepressants. Yeah, they were illegal drugs, so okay. uh, recreational drugs. So I was take, just taking uh, recreational. I wasn't on any form of medication. So they were all illegal. Um, what I was using was all illegal. And I was still doing this, but I didn't have the energy and I didn't have the power to be able to tell him, to be able to openly outline and say, you know what, I've been using drugs from the age of 14. I'm now 39. Um, I need some help here. I kept masking it. I kept telling myself a lie. I kept putting on this mask of everything would be okay. And if I just buried it a little bit longer, things would be okay. And sadly, um, especially as men, we have a tendency to do that. It's kind of as, as if we've been conditioned not to ask for help. Um, and sadly, especially people around my age and generations before me have never been taught how to really express our emotions and know that it's actually okay to reach out for help. I think you're right there. And um, as, as you rightly said, today is, um, is it National Men's, Men's Day? Um, and men, the statistics are, are that men have a greater, greater um, uh, suicide rates and suffer more with mental health than women. Why do you think that is, Steve? The thing with suicide is it's complex and there is a complex interplay of biological, psychological, past history and current life events that could contribute to anybody thinking about suicide. But if we go back again to the story, I want to tell you a story of what happened when I was younger. And so I'm seven years old and I'm playing ball in the back garden with my brother and he's 
throws me this ball and it's a, it's a little tennis ball. And the only thing that's separating our garden and my neighbor's garden is probably a foot high of chicken wire. And my next door neighbors love to drink and they were heavy drinkers. But every time they used to finish the bottles, instead of throwing them into the bin, what they would do is throw them into the garden. So the garden was just littered with glass. So my brother throws me the ball, me being keen to, to go and collect it. I run across into the next door neighbor's garden and instantly I just plant my hand on a shard of glass. So I've got this shard of glass sticking out of my hand and I look at it and my hand's pouring with blood. And I run back into my mum into the kitchen and she looks at it and she's starting to fill the sink up. She puts a plug into the sink. She's filling the sink up with warm water and then she grabs the glass and yanks it out. Ow. Oh gosh, okay. Yes. I so, can feel that to today. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So she's yanked this piece of glass out and I'm almost passing out. Blood is pouring everywhere. I'm crying. And guess what she said to me at that point? What did she say? You'll never forget this. No, no, even worse. She said, man up, big boys don't. Oh, no. Yeah, so I'm seven years old, and we know that the first seven years of our life are the most important. So but, what did I do from then on in with all those feelings? And, and what, who did I turn to, or who could I not turn to, to talk about my feelings? What did I do at that point? I buried them. Then on, I was conditioned not to talk. I was conditioned not to cry. So I thought, you know what, this peer, this person that has my best intentions at heart, I can't go to them. I can't go to them because they've told me big boys don't cry. If I cry now, I'll look weak. So that, I buried those feelings deep inside until I was 39 years old. And where women, I mean, as women, we, we talk, let's face it, we, we love talking. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying that mental health is, is, uh, affects men as well. Women and men are affected. But certainly women will pick up the phone to their friends more naturally. They will talk about things um, where I think men, as, as you say, they're, they're taught to suppress their emotions and not show them. It's almost like a sign of weakness. Um, Bringing, coming back to sort of um, the reality that we're living in today, you know, it's not, it's not even those that are, that are suffering where, where they've had people that have been affected. I think every single one of us has suffered from in one way or another, even people that are, you know, I, I live on my own and I'm very much an extra, I love going out and seeing people. So that in itself is quite hard. And I'm, and I'm, you know, and I'm a coach myself and I know the tools to get over those sort of things, but there must be so many people that are really suffering from either loneliness, um, depression, obviously everything that's going on in the economy, so financial stress, um, and it really boils down to the uncertainty of it all, Steve. What advice um, and tips would you give to people that are, that are watching this um, that, that maybe are suffering um, and they don't know what to do about it. And that's a really good question. You are right, absolutely right at this moment. If we think about it like this, it's a global traumatic crisis. And unlike the crisis of 2008, where the financial crisis and the crash, where a few people were affected by this, we look at it like this. This is global. So this is happening to us all. This has impacted everybody in some way, shape or form. And again, if we you know, consider what it actually is, it's a global traumatic crisis. So that trauma may impact people in different ways. It may not be apparent today. And we don't know yet, sadly, what the statistics will be around male suicide or any suicide for that given matter. Because it takes anywhere up to six months for the coroner to be able to say what the cause of death was. So without going too far into that, what we must be looking at now is how we can support ourselves. And that is the most important thing that we can do right now. I like to use the three Fs and those are faith, <laughs> family and friends. Sorry, can you repeat that, Steve? Was that? Yeah, certainly. It's the three Fs. So yeah. faith family and friends. So using your faith, um, mine is spirituality. So I can call on that at any time. If I think, you know what, something isn't quite right here. Maybe I'll go and read something. Maybe I'll go and practice something to do with my faith. Family, at any point, I can reach out to any one of my family 
because I know that they'll be there if I say, you know what, I'm not feeling great at the moment and I need some support with my emotional health. And a way to ask, as opposed to just offloading to somebody and saying, right, here you go, here's all of my stuff. How I like to ask this is, do you have the emotional capacity to take on what I'm about to tell you? So what I don't do is just offload it. So I ask them if they've got the emotional capacity to take that on. And with that, that, that's a kind of way of saying, I really need to talk right now. Have you got the capacity to take it? Because we've got a tendency just to offload and talk. So the reason why I say I have more than one as well, the reason why I say to people, I have more than one person that you can reach out to is because that person could be busy. We might not be able to get hold of them. And we know that the more people that you've got in your support network, the easier it is to find somebody at time of crisis to be able to talk. So finally, we've got the faith family and friends. So I tend to have more than one person that knows me, that really knows me. So when they speak to me, they'll say, Steve, how are you feeling today? We go beyond the asking, how do you feel? Because when I say, sorry, how are you? Rather? Because when we ask that question, like you said at the beginning, how are you? I said, I'm adjusting. And you know what, this is the time right now to be answering that question truthfully. And when we ask that question to somebody else, be genuine. If you want to know about them, this is what we need to do. Right now, we don't need to be checking up on people. We need to be checking. Is it, though, the people that are talking that have the issues um, or, or, or that are suffering, or is it more the people that we aren't hearing from that could be suffering more. I mean, it, it, there are people out there that just can't talk. Maybe they haven't got to that stage where they're willing to pick up their phone to the family and friends. Mm -hmm. Now, if a family or a friend is worried about somebody in that situation, what can they do if they suspect or if, if there, are, are there are signs that um, somebody is suffering, what, what, what are those signs? Again, that's really interesting, and more people will be displaying those signs now more than ever. Um, something I teach on a lot of the courses is how to spot those signs and how to ask the question. There's a lot of fear, especially around suicide, that we, if we ask the question, um, uh, uh, and I'll phrase it like this, I've noticed something isn't quite right about you recently. I've noticed you've been drinking more. I noticed you've been sleeping more, or I noticed you haven't been yourself. Generally, when people have been drinking more, sleeping more, or whatever the case may be there, um, people are having thoughts of suicide. Are you having thoughts of suicide? And so we open up that dialogue and we say to that person that we've noticed something different about them instead of just going in and say, are you okay? Yeah. Because you no, know, when we say, are you okay? They'll just go, either fine. yes, I'm fine, or, fine. Yeah, or, or not respond. So, you know, it's, it, it's going into a little bit more depth about that question and saying to them what we've noticed. So we've noticed you, you look a bit unkept at the moment. Is everything okay? Would you like to talk about that? I've noticed that. Or are you having those thoughts? We've had a question in which we, we, we have talked about earlier, it's being International Men's Day. Um, what are the easiest way that we can support men around us to, to help them open up? Um, this may have been from a woman, I don't, I don't know, but um, is there a way that you would suggest, um, particularly aiming it at men, how, because um, I think like you say, men are all, will, will want to sort of almost go into their man cave, I, I guess, especially if it's a woman potentially mm -hmm. sort of saying, come on, darling, what's wrong? You, you know, you don't seem to be um, acting the way you used to or whatever. Is, is, there, is there a way that you suggest us talking to, to our, love, our men that we love? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I seen something this morning actually, which, which made me smile, and it was um, it was a meme about you know if we say to um, a woman, okay, everything's going to be all right if they're shouting and screaming, and then the woman instantly is pacified. It's like, hang on, that doesn't work. Um, we just usually need a cuddle, <laughs> or I love you, darling, or don't you look lovely? We, yeah, we we want love. That that's usually that that's it for a woman, really. Yeah, uh, well, and, and, you're significant and feel love. <laughs> yeah, 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 just give a man food then. <laughs> give yeah. a man food. Um, but going back to that question, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's really, really interesting. What can we say? Um, at that point, 
if we've never been shown how to express our emotions and to be able to talk, knowing that somebody is there for when we are ready to do that talking is probably the most important thing that you can do. Um, talking from experience here, not being able to speak for almost 29 years and express how I really truly felt emotionally, meeting somebody that said, I'm here ready for when you are ready. And that was enough because I knew at that time that was enough for me to say, what does that mean? And then that opened up that dialogue. Men find it increasingly difficult initially to speak to people, especially we, if we've had that experience like I had when I was younger. Um, so what we're currently finding is more men are turning to apps, more men are turning to um, uh, websites for advice and support before they go and speak to a person. You think men prefer talking to men? That's a good question. In my experience, not always. Um, no, no. If we look at the construction industry, uh, if we look at that, they've got the highest fatality rate um, in the construction industry, mainly because they got access to lethal means. Um, I mean, that's not just because they're jumping off building sites, is it? I hope not. No, no, sadly not. But we can see with this um, that they're not openly being able to talk or speak about it. Yeah, there's banter and it's kind of, you know, pushed off and pushed away, but it's never acknowledged. And that's the thing. You know, when somebody talks to me about their mental health, we must acknowledge that and we must say to them, we must not minimise it. We must say, OK, tell me more. I understand. And it's been able to listen non-judgmentally and give them that space and even sitting in that space with them for a while. If somebody says to you, you know what, I'm really struggling right now. It's not for us to offer our solutions. It's not to, uh, for us to say, oh, you know what, I've got a great solution for that. Let's do this and let's do that. So before we offer anything that we can um, offer to them, we must ask them, is there anything that you would do? Is there anything that I can do for you at this point? So it's almost like we, they need and we need permission. Steve, um, what, are your, what are your views on um, maybe suggesting somebody see a GP or go on some sort of um, medication? Now, um, I have I have a friend who, who has suffered in COVID and, and he went to his GP and he was automatically put on antidepressants. Mm -hmm. um, now I've got some views on that. I'm, I'm not saying everybody shouldn't be on them. I just think that, that it's a quick fix and it's a GP's way of quickly fixing something that, and we're looking at, at the symptoms, not the actual cause. What are, what are your views around that? I think with medication, it has its place does genuinely have its place. It isn't the be all and end all and the cure. Um, so for my own diagnosis, I was diagnosed with borderline PTSD, high function anxiety, work related stress, unresolved childhood trauma and addiction and high function anxiety all in one go. And my choice was medication or take the holistic approach to cure and go through different types of holistic therapies. Um, in fact, there were eight different types of interventions. I chose that way because I didn't want to mask what was going on. So medication for me was nothing sticking plaster, but it's only ever given in these to mask, I guess, literally for just a short period of time to mask those symptoms or somebody feels well again. They're never, ever going to address the root cause. However, like I say, with some medication, it really, really does help. So with this, I'm saying, explore explore the more holistic approaches to cure so there's things like you know we can go and exercise more we can go and look at our diet we can use personal development and self-development we can use coaches like yourself to move us forward because what i found when i was working within the nhs is that people were getting stuck in their diagnosis and on their medication and sadly there were not enough coaches to move them forwards there are some amazing coaches out there right now doing amazing things. And once we've got that diagnosis and being told this is a short term on medication, look at different ways of proactively being able to look after your mental health and well-being. Because if we don't make time for our wellness, we will be forced to make time for our illness. Uh, that, that's fa fantastic. Um, yeah, absolutely bang on there. Um, are there any other practical tips or advice that you could give the audience 
um, at this stage? Um, and I know you've just given a few, maybe seek out coaches, exercise. Is there anybody, anything else that somebody can be doing? Yeah, absolutely. There's lots that workplaces can be doing. Um, so they can implement mental health first aiders. They can implement emotional health and wellbeing first aid toolkits, which is a proactive intervention to help the individual look after their wellbeing. And we need to create cultures of openness right at this moment. So we need to have open spaces within organisations that people can talk about their mental health. So we need to have more managers trained in how to spot the signs and symptoms of poor mental health for their staff. And also there are many, many great apps from the Hub of Hope, which is a database of um, mental health services in any geographical location. So that's Hub of Hope. There's the Shout text-based service on 85258 and Samaritans on 116123. If you've never spoken to your GP on mental health before, go on to docready.org and there's a great download there where you can pen in everything that you're thinking about or about your mental health that you want to discuss with your doctor. So it's kind of like an open letter you take to your doctor and then you can discuss it more. Because what we're finding is that more and more people that are now going to their GPs um, need to speak about their mental health, but they can't always articulate it so well. Steve, I think you've given some amazing knowledge bombs and some great advice and tips. I've got to say thank you so much for being a guest um, today on this fireside where, you know, we've really talked about such an important topic and a topic that certainly isn't going to go away in the near future. Um, and if there is anyone out there that's suffering, please do listen to this. Thank you, everyone.